Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD, General Physician. All my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. In continuity with the previous series, which we have started on neurology or nervous system examination. This will be another very, very useful or we call baseline chapter in understanding good number of disease because this will be one of the things which will be happening in many, many disorders in CNS. That is, we call raised intracranial pressure. If you understand the basic concept of raised intracranial pressure, it will be very helpful to you in identifying the conditions which will elevate raised intracranial pressure. Because if you miss this, person can end up with herniation. And once the herniation starts, complications are more, morbidity and mortality are very high. So, raise intracranial pressure or increase intracranial pressure. So, first you have to understand what is intracranial pressure and then what is raised intracranial pressure. So, we will be going through all these different headings. So, first what is intracranial pressure? means it is the pressure which will be created by the structure which are present inside the skull cavity. And that is by brain, CSF and blood flow. This will be the three main structure which will be creating a intracranial pressure. Because skull is a closed cavity, it cannot expand. So whatever structure which are present inside the skull cavity, they create certain amount of pressure. And that we call as intracranial pressure. Normal intracranial pressure is 10 millimeter of mercury in supine posture at the level of foramen of Monroe. It is pulsatile. It fluctuates with respiration, with inspiration and expiration. If it increases and if it goes above 20 millimeter of mercury, now it will start producing symptoms and signs. And those will be very frequently because of pressure created on brain structures. So normal pressure at the foramen of Monroe ranges from 10 millimeter to 15 millimeter of mercury or if you calculate in form of a millimeter of water it will be 10 100 to 250 millimeter of water so if pressure at foramen of Monroe in supine posture is more than 250 millimeter of water or more than 20 millimeter of mercury it will be considered as raised intracranial pressure. Now this particular will be divided into stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4 and stage 5. So once the pressure starts rising, now you will start having a compensatory mechanism which will be playing a role and that will produce a full compensatory pause, full compensation. In state 2, there will be partial compensation. In state 3, there will be beginning of decompensation. And once the pressure goes above a certain level, then you will start having herniation. And stage 5 will be compression of medulla, resulting into disturbances in cardiorespiratory function. And person can have mortality in the form of death. We will be dealing this in detail further. So anything which increases the brain mass. Classical example is because of cerebral edema or because of mass or we call SOL 
which can be because of abscess hematoma or because of tumor which can be benign can be malignant and malignant can be primary from brain tissue itself we call gliomas or secondary metastasis or because of accumulation of csf as for example in case of hydrocephalus more common with non occlusive hydrocephalus rather than uh, sorry because of occlusive hydrocephalus and non occlusive hydrocephalus but in a case of a normal pressure hydrocephalus intracranial pressure may be normal we already mentioned regarding sol cerebral edema and there may be some of the groups which can also have pressure elevation because of hypertensive complications because of increased blood flow like reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or maybe even because of the obstruction to the csf flow csf absorption is being affected because of occlusion of the venous sinuses like superior sagittal sinus thrombosis or cortical vein thrombosis etc now cerebral edema can be because of infection trauma tumor vascular any one of these groups so indirectly intracranial pressure can be elevated in infection which can be bacterial viral tubercular or fungal in trauma we usually mention traumatic brain injury tumor we already mentioned may be benign may be malignant and malignant can be primary can be secondary vascular very frequently it will be because of intracranial hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage or it may be because of hypertensive complications like rcvs or press or maybe hypertensive encephalopathy or maybe even because of venous thrombosis like superior sagittal sinus or venous cortical venous thrombosis we already mentioned regarding hydrocephalus occlusive or non occlusive hydrocephalus space occupying lesion may be because of tumor abscess hematoma cyst tuberculoma intracranial hemorrhage that is hematoma or even cystic sarcosis etc we already mentioned cerebral edema can be because of tumor hypoxia toxic condition hypertension infection trauma etc or you can divide cerebral edema into vasogenic cytotoxic osmotic hydrocytic those five groups so this will be the etiology of raised intracranial pressure so increase in the blood volume will be all these conditions where you will have brain expands like intracranial sol brain tumors abscess hematoma vascular malformation cerebral edema which can be because of encephalitis meningitis hypoxic traumatic brain injury hepatic encephalopathy ray syndrome stroke ray syndromes etc while increase in the csf volume can be because of choroid plexus papilledema papilloma or hydrocephalus now here you can also divide we'll be dealing in detail in chapter of hydrocephalus because of increased formation sluggish circulation decrease reabsorption of csf etc and increase in the blood volume because of vascular malformation cerebral venous thrombosis and increase blood flow in case of inflammation like meningitis encephalitis etc plus also increase blood flow in case of hypertensive encephalopathy or we call press or rcvs to understand the basic of intracranial pressure mm-hmm. and elevation of intracranial pressure it is very simple that the brain is 
a closed container made up of a bony structure we call skull so skull is a bony structure and brain is inside the bony structure and this intracranial space is occupied by three main components where brain constitute 80% of the space cerebrospinal fluid is 10% and blood is occupying 10% and all these three structure together create a pressure of 10 to 15 mm of mercury and if it increases more than 20 mm then we'll call that as raised intracranial pressure so anything which increase the cerebrospinal fluid or anything which increase the brain mass or volume of the brain or anything which increase the blood component inside the cranial cavity will elevate intracranial pressure. So brain tissue can be affected and size of brain which is 1400 ml can increase in case of infection, trauma, vascular like cerebral edema, tumors or edema. While CSF can be increased because of increased formation, sluggish circulation, so formation becomes more than circulation, absorption is affected, or there is an obstruction to the cerebral blood flow, cerebrospinal blood flow, or sorry, cerebrospinal fluid flow. Venous blood flow is more as compared to arterial blood flow. So if there is an obstruction to the venous flow, like thrombosis, obstruction, or maybe because of even cardiac condition, which can elevate the venous pressure, say even in case of right side heart failure, any condition which increases the right atrial pressure like tricuspid stenosis, tricuspid atresia, or pericardial condition like constrictive pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, massive pericardial effusion. In all those conditions also, right atrial pressure will be markedly elevated. Even in case of superior vena cava occlusion or jugular vein occlusion will elevate your intracranial pressure. And as far as the arterial blood flow increase is concerned. It will be because of hyperperfusion. Classical example will be hypertensive encephalopathy. And there are two other names we call press, posterior, reversible, encephalopathy syndrome or RCVS that is reversible, cardiovascular vasoconstriction syndrome. These are the complications because of increased blood flow and disturbances in autoregulation. So that is very common in hypertension. Or you might have even perfusion of the brain can be affected because of O2 that is hypoxia or excess of carbon dioxide which will produce vasodilatation we call hypercarbia or because of acidosis also there is disturbances in blood flow because of cerebral vasodilatation. Classical example diabetic ketoacidosis and then it will end up into cerebral edema. And there will be also opposite of that. If you have got a severe hypoperfusion, it will produce severe hypoxia and damage to the brain. Hypoxic damage to the brain and that can also produce cerebral edema one of the condition and it will produce cytotoxic variety of cerebral edema. Example like shock. So intracranial pressure can be elevated. Here already we have mentioned that brain tissue almost 80 percent, vascular almost 10 percent and cerebrospinal fluid also around 10 percent. And of that intravascular blood flow, venous blood system is more as compared to arterial. 
so increase in the volume of intracranial constituents or by other structures other than brain blood or cerebrospinal fluid we call sol say like localized mass lesion abscess hematoma tuberculoma etc and there may be disturbances in csf circulation or obstruction of the venous sinuses or diffuse cerebral edema or sometime even we don't know the cause and that can be also because of increased venous pressure and because of obstruction to the csf flow or absorption that will also be one of the reason by which the csf will accumulate more in the cranial cavity and gives rise to raised intracranial pressure so localized mass lesion is very frequently because of hematoma neoplasm abscess or maybe because of focal edema secondary due to trauma infarction or tumors because of disturbances in csf circulation like obstructive hydrocephalus or communicating hydrocephalus venous sinus occlusions because of fractures or thrombosis brain edema which can be because of encephalitis meningitis head injury or traumatic brain injury subarachnoid hemorrhage ray syndrome other variety of encephalopathy water intoxication near drowning severe hypoxia there are many many causes and once in a while we don't understand then we call that as a idiopathic intracranial hypertension or benign intracranial hypertension so there are a lot of factor which in alters the intracranial pressure like body temperature oxygen status carbon dioxide level particularly hypercarbia and you can utilize hyperventilation which will wash out carbon dioxide and bring down the co2 level and that will produce vasoconstriction as a treatment part of it and hyperbaric oxygen will be one of the factor which can help you to reduce the cerebral blood flow oxygen level body position arterial and venous pressure anything which increases the intra abdominal pressure or thoracic pressure say even while valsalva maneuver can also increase your intracranial pressure on also vomiting bearing down etc can also increase your intracranial pressure most common will be mass lesion cerebral edema traumatic brain injury inflammation secondary due to infection like meningitis encephalitis or metabolic insult maybe hypoglycemia hypoxia hypercarbia acidosis etc all these factors can affect cerebral blood flow and can produce raised intracranial pressure but what is happening because of raised intracranial pressure because of raised intracranial pressure cerebral perfusion pressure is being affected it will decrease because mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure will be parallel to cerebral perfusion pressure and because of decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure there will be decreased cerebral blood flow which will end up with ischemia and ischemia will produce damage to cerebral cells where if there is a severe ischemia you will have damage to sodium and potassium pump which will result into influx of sodium along with sodium water will enter inside and it will result into cerebral edema and because of increase in cerebral edema part brain volume will be increased and that will increase your intracranial pressure and this cycle will continue this will be one of the main mechanism in case of raised intracranial pressure irrespective of what is the cause so we'll be showing you in two different slides how exactly it will affect so cranial insults maybe anything infection trauma tumor vascular hydrocephalus all those insult there will be tissue edema or we call cerebral edema increase in intracranial pressure compression of blood vessel decrease cerebral blood flow hypoxia death of a brain cells edema around the necrotic tissue 
which will further aggravate your intracranial pressure. Now, once the intracranial pressure shoots up a certain level, now you will have a shift of brain substances. So, brain will be shifting, will be compressed because skull is a bony structure and it is a closed cavity. So, now brain will be compressed from the surrounding. So, that will start producing compression of the brain tissue and brain will start shifting and that shift we call as herniation and because of that you will have now pressure over different cranial nerves brain structures and when the medulla starts coning down along with that the tonsillar part of the cerebellum compresses the medulla and it will affect the respiratory center and once the respiratory center is affected you will start having disturbances in respiration you will have chine stroke breathing bad breathing and you will have accumulation of carbon dioxide which will produce vasodilatation hypercarbia and it will produce vasodilatation and secondary to vasodilatation further intracranial pressure will be elevated increased blood flow and then finally person will have a compression of medulla affecting cardiac center as well as respiratory center and person will go into either cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest or both and that will end into death. So, decreasing cerebral blood flow, ischemia and that will result into Cushing response which is a compensatory mechanism. Vasomotor center will be triggered and that vasomotor center will produce vasoconstriction, tachycardia increase in arterial pressure as well as sympathetic mediated response will result into increase in systolic blood pressure, widening of pulse pressure and decrease in the heart rate. This will be two things together. So elevation of systolic blood pressure, widening of pulse pressure and decrease in the heart rate that we call as Cushing response. And if there is ineffective autoregulation, it will de results into decompensation. So this will be compensatory stage and from compensatory stage it will go into decompensatory stage. Now blood flow will reduce, it will produce ischemia and it will end into infarction and that will signify by change in the vital signs and person will now develop what we call as a Cushing triad. So once there is a Cushing response, it is a compensation which is going on. And once the person develops Cushing triad, it is a decompensation where person will have a bradycardia, hypertension and bradypnea. When these three things are together, we call it a Cushing triad. And then it will lead to herniation of a brain stem and occlusion of the cerebral blood flow. And then now person will have coning, which will be a grave sign and person can finally die because of cardiac arrest. So raise intracranial pressure. Intracranial pressure is more than mean arterial pressure, cerebral ischemia, activation of autonomic nervous system, tachycardia, increased cardiac output, hypertension will end, systolic pressure will be elevated, baroreceptor and vagus nerve stimulation will produce bradycardia. Then we have already mentioned this will be Cushing response. So we'll have a systolic pressure elevation, bradycardia, wide pulse pressure and further elevation, brain compression, irregular breathing we call as chine stroke breathing, Bard's breathing or we call bradypnea, bradycardia and hypertension that will be Cushing triad. So, if any one of these components, venous volume, arterial volume, brain or CSF, any one of this expands, say brain expands because of mass as well. So, now first thing to be compressed will be CSF. So, CSF will outflow from the cranial cavity, compensatory mechanism. 
Second compensatory mechanism will be venous flow. Arterial flow will be maintained. This will be in a compensated state. So in a compensated state, venous volume will reduce to some extent and CSF content will reduce to some extent. And during this particular time, because of this compensation, intracranial pressure is still normal. It is between 15 to 20. As further elevation, now CSF will be squeezed out. Venous volume will be also squeezed out. Now what is being protected is brain and blood supply. Now this we call as uncompensated stage. So now person is going into decompensation. And during this stage, now brain will get compressed. Blood flow will be compensated and that will produce ischemia. So two things will be compressed. Brain will be compressed and blood flow, arterial blood flow will also compressed. And that will reduce blood flow to the brain leading to ischemia and then necrosis. So cerebral blood flow will depend upon the pressure upon the resistance and cerebral blood flow is equal to cerebral perfusion pressure divided by cerebral vascular resistance and cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to mean systolic pressure or mean arterial pressure minus mean intracranial pressure. So if this intracranial pressure starts rising, cerebral perfusion pressure will fall and cerebral blood flow will further fall because if cerebral perfusion decreases and cerebral vascular resistance increases, then cerebral blood flow will be affected and cerebral perfusion pressure decreases because of mean intracranial pressure. And when the cerebral perfusion pressure to a low level, brain is not perfused and brain tissue will undergo necrosis because of severe ischemia. In stage 1 and stage 2, there is compensation which is going on. So still the pressure, cerebral perfusion is compensated and intracranial pressure is not much elevated. And in stage 3 and 4, decompensation takes place. In stage 4 and 5, you will have a herniation. So once the herniation starts, compression will start. You have got decompensation and compression of medulla will begin. And then in stage 5, the person can end into a death stage. So this will be a very simple way. So in stage 3 and 4, now you will have shift of a brain tissue. You will call that as herniation. Depending upon the site, suppose if you person has got right side hematoma, this, then brain will be shifted to left side. If it is supratentorial, you will have subfalcine or uncle herniation. And if it is infratentorial, you will have an upward herniation or a downward herniation. We will be talking more in detail in chapter of herniation. So if you have got anything above the supratentorial, lesion above the supratentorial, you will have a subfalcine, subfalcine here, this portion, subfalcine herniation or uncle herniation or we call transtentorial herniation. And in case of an infratentorial, either the material will be pushed up or pushed down. Pushed down will be Tonsillar herniation pushed up will be transtentorial herniation. That will be in a infratentorial lesions. We'll be talking in detail. So cerebral perfusion pressure will depend upon a mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. And as soon as that is being affected, person will have altered level of consciousness. That is Glasgow coma scale will be affected. Person will have right from drowsy to a coma. Because of cerebral edema, person can have seizures. Because of raised intracranial pressure, headache, vomiting and blood vessel. Meninges will be stretched, which will produce headache and neck pain. And you can have neck rigidity. Vagus nerve will produce vomiting and bradycardia. 
capillary edema will be because of venous drainage of optic nerve will be affected and that will produce papillary edema and that will produce blurred vision and if papillary edema is very severe even person can have complete loss of vision compensation is done by shift of csf from intracranial space into spinal space once the intracranial pressure increases to a very high level now the shift of the brain will take place across the fox cerebri or across the tentorium cerebelli this we call as a herniation in children that is infants because of now raised intracranial pressure as cranial bones sutures has not fused there will be separation of sutures bulging of fontanelles you can have sunset signs crackpot sign or also called as a mcwen sign and head size will be increased or circumference of the head will be increased if we go through the clinical feature it will depend upon which stage you are examining so first two are compensatory stage 1 full compensation now decompensation starts you will have a partial compensation means person is now going into decompensated stage stage 3 will be decompensation beginning of decompensation and now you will start having shifting of the brain that will be herniation that will become stage 4 and in stage 5 compression of the cardio respiratory center and person can die this will be very classic now one of the common clue which you can pick up very early that is if any person who comes to with a severe headache intractable vomiting or we call projectile vomiting without any pain in abdomen without any gi symptoms more in the early morning and if there is an associated blurred vision due to papillary edema and if it is unilateral papillary edema or bilateral papillary edema do keep it in mind is it due to raised intracranial pressure and try to examine the person properly if along with this if you get now focal neurological signs in the form of anisocoria we call as unequal pupil or there is one side pupil is dilated and fixed not reacting to light that suggests now the person is going into decompensation stage almost in stage 3 and good number of time you will start having abnormal pupil you will have abnormality in eyeball movements person can have diplopia because of sixth cranial nerve palsy or third cranial nerve palsy then you can have compression of the brain stem structures producing motor weakness sensory symptoms cranial nerve palsy etc that should be that is indirectly a bad stage we'll be going through what is happening here so in stage 1 person is fully alert well oriented there is some previous history of some injury to the brain vital signs and pupillary response are normal means blood pressure is normal temperature is normal respiration is normal pupils are reacting to light normal size but only one complaint because of slight elevation of intracranial pressure is headache in stage 2 now person is trying to compensate but compensation is not full so now person will start having effect on perfusion of the brain and that will produce altered mental status so person will be confused restless altered level of consciousness right from lethargy but still blood pressure pulse respiration temperature and pupil is normal now in stage 3 now you have got further elevation of intracranial pressure and you will have a cushing response 
and because of closing response now the blood pressure starts rising you will have a wide pulse pressure you will have a compression of a cardio respiratory center it will produce bradypnea bradycardia we will call that as a cushing triad and as a cushing response in a compensatory stage you have got already wide pulse pressure and you have got bradycardia because of further cerebral edema now person has got further decrease in the level of consciousness person right from drowsy has become stupor or may have gone into comatose stage now third cranial nerve is getting compressed and that third cranial nerve compression will start producing now changes in the pupil pupil will start becoming dilated and there will be poor response to light vomiting may start and person will have a projectile vomiting so this is a typical phenomena we call the cushing triad where you have got a systolic pressure elevation diastolic pressure may remain normal so you will have a wide pulse pressure low volume pulse and you will have a bradypnea and bradycardia this is classical cushing triad so bradycardia bradypnea and wide pulse pressure with systolic pressure elevation will be called as cushing triad and in case of a shock stage you can see that person will always have tachycardia there will be tachypnea and there will be fall of systolic blood pressure as well as diastolic blood pressure this will be finding you will come across in a case of a shock stage so you must be able to recognize that if with elevation of systolic blood pressure if the person is having bradycardia and bradypnea and altered level of consciousness do suspect person is almost heading towards state 3 to state 4 so cushing triad is classical systolic blood pressure elevation wide pulse pressure bradypnea and bradycardia so that will be peculiar so try to identify that and don't confuse this with cushing syndrome cushing triad you should not confuse with cushing syndrome now herniation is already begin there are compression of the nerves first nerve to be affected will be third cranial nerve and the sixth cranial nerve which will produce dilated pupil or we call as maybe on one side or maybe both bilateral and this will be leading to anisocoria or bilateral dilated pupil anisocoria will be one side first on the side where there is a first compression so if it is a compression from the right side right third cranial nerve will be first affected so my right side pupil will be dilated not reacting to light will be suggestive that there is a compression from the right side and person will further deteriorate as far as level of consciousness is concerned person will be comatose or we'll call deep coma and now person will have a motor changes in the form of decorticate posture initially where person will have a flexion of the upper limb and in a decerebrate posture extension of the upper limb and in a late stage total flaccidity and cushing triad will proceed to now the pulse pressure will be narrow because now systolic blood pressure will fall pulse volume will fall person will have a weak 3d pulse and person will not start having chain stroke breathing ataxic breathing bards breathing and finally person will go into cardio respiratory arrest and death so in a initial stage if you pick up in early as early as possible before even a person starts getting dilated pupil not reacting to light earliest symptom will be headache altered level of consciousness will suggest the person is in almost in stage 3 altered level to loss of consciousness will be stage 4 nearly difficulty in concentration will again suggest stage 3 you have got cushing triads in the form of hypertension wide pulse pressure bradycardia and bradypnea that is cushing triad will be again going in favor of state 3 seizures will be in state 3 and 4 loss of reflexes again in state 3 and 4 because almost 
now nervous system is getting compressed and you are getting damage to the nervous system so it will be very very difficult if you pick them in early stage like headache irritability vomiting photophobia there's a little amount of nystagmus diplopia is started lethargy or seizures this will be the early stage of raised intracranial pressure and this will be almost in stage 3 and 4 where you got now altered level of consciousness glasgow coma scale is decreasing there is an ipsilateral pupil which is being dilated not reacting to light now person starts developing neurological symptoms and signs contralateral lesions pupillary lesions ipsilateral hemiparesis coussing triads widening of pulse pressure bradycardia irregular respiration all this becomes a bad signs or we call late signs so earliest sign headache nausea vomiting and papilledema you should be able to pick up in this early stage once this particular three findings is associated with altered level of consciousness now he is almost in stage 3 and stage 4 six cranial nerve palsy false localizing sign this particular will be in almost stage 3 and 4 and further deterioration of level of consciousness will be stage 3 to stage 4 and when in a infant we already said that you will start having enlargement of the head size the fontanelle will be tense and bulging you will have a separation of skull sutures sunset sign prominent scalp vein and you will have a crackpot sign or we call macwen sign so this is abduction nerve palsy you can see that this eyeball cannot move to lateral side this is you can see this is in the center position this has been deviated medially because this is unopposed action of lateral rectus which has been affected because of abduction nerve palsy so this will be right side because this is right eye right eye of a patient right side abduction palsy so person will have that but pupil will not be affected if pupil is affected with strabismus then it will be more in favor of third cranial nerve palsy so you will have to identify as early as possible headache is because of traction of vessel compression of dura mater it is usually throbbing in nature bursting in nature worst in the morning it can be exaggerated by coughing sneezing or on exertion and relieved by vomiting or my by a mild analgesic drugs and it is very very frequently associated with visual disturbances because of papilledema and projectile vomiting very very characteristic of a raised intracranial pressure you should be able to pick up as early as possible so you can have eye changes posture changes will be a late sign almost in stage 4 that is decerebrate posture first decorticate followed by decerebrate and then flaccid and you can have a motor weakness in the form of cranial nerve palsy hemiplegia opposite side hemiplegia then ipsilateral hemiplegia all those headache seizures coughing triad vomiting speech disturbances and in infant we already mentioned bulging of the suture separation of the sutures head circumference is increased high pitch cry crack pot sign sunset sign etc so motor response will be very useful in localizing the lesion whether it is cerebral or non cerebral abnormal flexion abnormal extension and abnormal response will suggest localizing signs will be more in favor of cerebral withdrawal response again cerebral lesions abnormal flexion cerebral hemispheric dysfunction abnormal extension brain stem compression has already started and absence of response will be suggest that already brain stem compression is in the ponto medullary junction now almost the person has got flaccid so decorticate posture typical extensor posture we call decerebrate posture and in the end stage you will have complete flaccid 
complete flaccid, no response. So that will be almost compression of medulla. If you look at the chine stroke breathing, it will be cerebral hemisphere and diencephalon damage, hyperventilation, midbrain and upper part of the pons getting damaged, apneustic breathing, midbrain and lower part of the pons. And when there is an ataxic breathing, it will be medulla. Finally, the person will have a bites breathing and apnea will be almost damaged to medullary part. You can divide the herniation into supratentorial, infratentorial, transcellular. I am not going into detail in this particular. We will be dealing separately in a herniation chapter. So, if you have got a herniation of this part, we call it a cingulate herniation or falcine herniation. And if the uncle part herniates to the tentorium, we call it the uncle herniation. And if the central part of the brainstem herniates, it is called central herniation. And in case of infratentorial lesions, cerebral tonsil will herniate early and that will produce, we call tonsillar herniation. And that is the most dangerous variety of herniation. And in a late stage of supratentorial herniations, you can have cerebellar tonsillar herniation. Upward herniation is not common in supratentorial. It is only in case of a infratentorial herniation. And depending upon that, so shift of brain is called herniation. In uncle herniation, the third cranial nerve will be first affected and then sixth cranial nerve is affected. Plus, you will have a CNS symptoms and signs. Third cranial nerve will produce anisocoria, dilated pupils, squint and diplopia. Cushing triad will be there in the form of systolic pressure elevation, wide pulse pressure, bradycardia and bradypnea. Singulate herniation will produce ACA compression, that is anterior cerebral artery compressions, and you will have opposite side hemiplegia. Central herniation will produce a midbrain compression. So almost we are covering up herniation symptoms and signs. And upward herniation will also compress the midbrain, damage to midbrain, and that will produce motor symptoms and signs, cranial nerve palsy. And when there is a fractured skull and gap in the skull, you will have a local herniation or extracranial herniation, you will have a local symptoms and signs. Respiration will be affected, blood pressure will be affected, pulse will be affected, pupil will be affected, altered level of consciousness and motor symptoms and signs. You look at all these things together, you will be able to pick up those particular things. So these are different herniation syndromes. Uncle herniation, central herniation, falcine herniation, midline shift, etc. We'll be talking all this in a herniation chapter. So respiration will be affected. So respiration will be more affected in stage 3 and 4. Chine stroke breathing, if there is a damage to the cortex. Central, in case of a midbrain damage. Apneustic breathing, in case of a pontine damage and bites breathing in case of a mandibulary damage. Cushing triad will be suggested because of systolic pressure elevation, wide pulse pressure, bradycardia, bradypnea, and that will be almost in stage 3 and 4. Pupil will be affected. You will have a dilated pupil in stage 1 to 5. Meiosis in stage 2, motor system, you will have decorticate posture if it is lesion above the midbrain, damage above the midbrain, decerebrate if it is in the midbrain, damage means in a central herniation, uncle herniation, in stage 3 and 4, you will start having decerebrate posture mainly in a stage 4 and then flaccid. Once the pons get damaged, you will have a flaccid. Means almost now medulla is getting damaged. These are all the slides which tells you regarding a different herniation.
so almost we have finished nearly herniation part still i will upload one slide or a one uh, video on a herniation which will be covering all this in little more detail so this will be uncle herniation findings you can have a pause and you can have a look in that what will be the finding in case of a uncle herniation i'll be talking in more detail this will be in a stage 2 early diencephalic stage this will be second stage this will be respiratory patterns what happens this is lower pontine stage transtentorial herniation what happens we'll go through at least in case of a herniation chapter as far as investigation is concerned x ray skull ap lateral basal and paranasal sinus ct scan mri scan will be helpful transcranial doppler will be also helpful electrophysiological monitoring and evoke potential monitoring will be also helpful to find out the severity of damage most important part will be intracranial monitoring this intracranial monitoring can be non invasive can be invasive invasive can be subdural subarachnoid intraparenchymal intraventricular or lumbar puncture monitoring by and large the best is interparenchymal that is the best or intraventricular pressure monitoring that is do, done during entire management of a person who is in stage 3 4 and 5 while non invasive you can go for different method that is tissue resonance analysis ocular sonography transcranial doppler intraocular pressure and tympanic membrane displacement findings this you can utilize in a non invasive technique of which transcranial doppler is very easy and ocular sonography or we call ocular ultrasounds will be very very useful because it is non invasive and an expert can give you a good idea regarding the intracranial pressure so in a non invasive technique these are all the different methods of which ocular sonography and transcranial doppler is very very useful being a non invasive technique while in invasive mainly the best will be interparenchymal and intraventricular because of raised intracranial pressure now you will have a pressure changes in a skull in a children you can see separation of the sutures you can see here the sutures skull sutures are separated so earliest sign will be separation of the sutures because of the pressure the pituitary fossa will be widened so there will be widening of pituitary fossa you will have separation of sutures and because of the pressure on the skull bones you will get bitten silver appearance so this will be the finding which you will come across we'll show you that this is bitten silver appearance appears like this this is a typical and this will be seen more commonly in children base seen in children you can see this is almost like this this is called silver bitten appearance or bitten silver appearance and along with that the widening of pituitary fossa and separation of sutures is the classical findings so monitoring is very important so non invasive monitoring as far as vital signs is concerned blood pressure management blood pressure measurements and pulse oximeter will be very useful and as far as the invasive monitoring is concerned central venous pressure abg electrolyte and intracranial pressure monitoring that will be useful so this is ventricular monitoring this is intraparenchymal monitoring and this is subdural variety so the tip is in the subdural space this is inside the parenchyma this is inside the ventricle and if it is pressed if this particular electrode is placed inside and between the parenchyma then it is called interparenchymal but by and large it will be intraparenchymal so this is the best and this is the second best when you measure the pressure in the ventricular system so this is ventricular system this is intraparenchymal so that is the best method of measuring the pressure and subdural is the another where your sensor is put into subdural space as far as the treatment part is concerned 
it can be medical management or surgical management surgical management will be very useful and very very important once the person goes into stage 3 and 4 so first is you prevent primary injury reduce parenchymal damage secondary injury reduce cerebral edema and reduce the amount of necrosis because of raised intracranial pressure for that you optimize the cerebral venous outflow you take care of respiratory temperature control blood pressure control treatment of anemia seizure control sedation and analgesics these are what we call a supportive line of treatment but most important is to reduce the intracranial pressure and for reducing the intracranial pressure one of the non invasive technique and very simple is elevation of head that is elevation of head of the bed in the midline and elevate the head position if pressure is very high and person is already in state 3 and state 4 you can go for drainage of csf via ventricular stomy into subarachnoid space you can go for osmotherapy like with mannitol 20% mannitol or hypertonic 3% hypertonic saline only in case of vasogenic shock or vasogenic edema because of tumor or because of abscess glucocorticoid may be of help glucocorticoid should not be utilized in other variety of cerebral edema it is very very useful in a vasogenic edema due to tumor or because of abscess you can take the advantage of hyperventilation which can reduce the pco2 and bring it down to 30 it will produce vasoconstriction by which the blood flow will be reduced and intracranial pressure can be lower if the person has got severe shock stage dopamine norepinephrine to maintain the mean arterial pressure should be done so mean arterial pressure should be maintained and then in a case of a refractory elevated intracranial pressure decompressive craniectomy is the choice or you can go for a high dose barbiturate therapy it is also called as a pentobarb coma or we call phenobarbitone coma and you can go even for hypothermia we call medical induced hypothermia so this will be another important thing as far as head elevation is concerned it is you elevate the head up to 30 degree diuretics you can use but they are not of much use so furosemide will be useful only in case of sidh mannitol will be useful but you have to take care that mannitol should not be used in a person with ckd acute mi ischemic heart disease person with congestive heart failure person with constrictive pericarditis cardiac tamponade in all those condition mannitol should not be used in a normal volumic person you can use iv infusions of crystalloids we have already mentioned regarding hyperventilation so reduce the pco2 to 30 you can use sedation muscle relaxant and you can have a csf withdrawal by number of lumbar punctures or by ventricular stomy fiber optic ventricular stomy and try to improve the glasgow coma scale so in general head elevation csf drainage hyperventilation osmotic diuresis barbit phenobarbitone coma hypothermia and in uncontrolled and in a acute elevation of raised intracranial pressure you can go for craniectomy or we call surgical intervention so same thing head elevation sedation mannitol hyperventilation and removal of csf so sedation cerebral perfusion pressure maintenance osmotherapy hyperventilation phenobarbitone coma hypothermia and in late stage surgical treatment so this is that step wise you can go same thing mention csf drainage sedation then chemical paralysis hyperosmolar therapy hyperventilation hypothermia barbiturate coma decompressive craniectomy these slides are not good but just they were showing you what you can do in stage 1 stage 
So these are the things which are being shown here. I could not get a better slide. So if you can read, you can go through your at leisure time. So decompressive hemicraniectomy is in a stage four and stage five, or you can go for bilateral frontal craniectomy. So this will be different types of crania craniectomy, craniotomy, craniectomy also. So complications, very common, you will come across, will be diabetes insipidus, SIDH, herniation, and brain death. You can get temporal coning, tonsillar coning, and you can have a third and sixth cranial nerve palsy, maybe unilateral, maybe bilateral, hemiparesis, and bilateral extensor plantar response because of damage to pyramidal tracts. But most important part, once the person starts getting herniation, you can have a damage to brain of any different varieties, depending upon the severity of cone. So I end my lecture here. I thank you all for taking out time. Almost major part of herniation also partly we have covered, but we'll be talking again regarding a herniation in the next lecture. So I thank you all for taking out time. I know that your time is valuable. And I appreciate you for spending some of the time with me. I feel this lecture will be helpful to you because if you understand raised intracranial pressure, because raised intracranial pressure is the most common phenomena which will take place in any type of injury to the brain. Maybe infection, trauma, tumor, vascular, or maybe even hypoxia, inflammation, or say even we can say ischemia, toxic drugs, chemicals, they can all produce damage to brain and they can end up with cerebral edema and raise intracranial pressure. So chapter of cerebral edema and chapter of raise intracranial pressure is absolutely necessary because anything in the intracranial damage can lead to cerebral edema and raise intracranial pressure. You should be aware of this. So this chapter is very, very important. And if you pick them early, you can give a good treatment and you can decrease the morbidity and mortality. So in the end of this lecture, if you like this lecture, please press button like. You can share with your friends. And if you've got any suggestions by which I can improve, and I try to make it as simple as possible, you can give your suggestions. I'll be very much happy to see and try to modify my things so at the end, you can share with your friends also. I end my lecture here. See you in next lecture on what we call as herniations.